Color, STEM Conference presents High Tech Sunday. On today's episode of High Tech Sunday, our hosts, Dr. Mark Vaughn and Lango Dean, sit down with 2011 Bea Scientist of the Year, Dr. Victor McCrary. Up first is Corning Incorporated's Manager of Technical Talent Pipelining, Dr. Mark Vaughn. Next is Career Communication Group's Senior Technology Editor, Lango Dean. Finally, our esteemed guest, Dr. Victor McCrary, Vice President for Research and Graduate Programs at the University of the District of Columbia, Dr. McCrary leads the growth, development, direction, and oversight of the university's research enterprise. He is a change agent and serial innovator, responsible for developing comprehensive, sustainable research strategies, fostering transdisciplinary research, and expanding research programs via engagement with federal and state agencies and private entities, including his significant contributions to Morgan State University, becoming one of only 130 universities nationwide to have an R2 status in the Carnegie classification of institutions of higher education. Without further delay, High Tech Sunday, featuring Dr. Mark Vaughn and Lango Dean. Thanks so much for the introduction and welcome everyone to today's High Tech Sunday podcast. We have really been fortunate to have an illustrious lineup of guests over the course of the past few months. And that trend continues today with Dr. Victor McCrary. We've heard a little bit about him in the introduction, but it is certainly a pleasure to welcome you, Dr. McCrary, to High Tech Sunday. How are you doing? Uh, Dr. Vaughn, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here, doing quite well. And um, even in our uh, COVID environment, um, we're still prospering and, and feeling blessed. So thank you for asking. Awesome. Well, I certainly am looking forward to our conversation today. I have followed your career and the impact of it, and of course had the pleasure of engaging you on many occasions down through the years. But today's topic is one that is certainly near and dear to many of us in the uh, CCG family, and that is historically black colleges and universities, and the fact that they are without doubt part of our nation's competitive asset for research in science and engineering. It is, again, not lost on any of us that this is a work that you have been engaged in for many years. And so before we jump into talking about HBCUs. Let's talk about you. Can you give us a sense of who Dr. Victor McCrary is? We always ask that question at the beginning of these conversations because we want to get to know you better. So can you talk to us about your journey and how it is that you landed in the field that you have been contributing to down through these years? Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I want the audience and I'm Victor McCrary. I was born in, in Washington, D.C., in, in Northeast Washington, D.C. Uh, both my parents were, were military, both in the Army. Uh, my mother was African American from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My father was uh, Caucasian American from um, the Westlands of, of Texas. They both met in the military in the early 50s during the Korean crisis, got married, had three kids. And uh, we settled in Washington because at that time, my father was stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia. And we couldn't be there because at that time, Virginia had miscegenation laws. Uh, and so in some sense, they were the lovings, just like the lovings, in the sense that they had to live apart. So we grew up in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, my father passed when I was eight years old, uh, about two days before he was retired in the Army at 43 of a heart attack. Um, but I will tell you this, uh, to the uh, benevolence of the U.S. government, and particularly the U.S. Army, they took good care of my mom and, and my brothers and sisters and sister, and um, we were all grew up in D.C. We started in D.C. public schools. Uh, my mother didn't like the way they were giving the message and encouraging us and uh, pulled us out of D.C. public schools, putting Catholic schools, and our journey has been, I've been that journey ever since. 
Um, where it comes in terms of HBCUs, um, my mother had to go back and uh, get her master's degree. Um, she went back to Howard University and got her master's degree in urban planning. And then when I got out of uh, graduated from DeMatha Catholic High School, went on to Catholic University, and then on a PhD, they encouraged me there, Dr. Bill Sanders and Dr. J.P. Hunt encouraged me to go on to Howard to work with a guy named Bill Jackson. And so that's how I started, and I saw all the magic that was going on there, as well as the history that went behind Howard University and other institutions like it. So about eight years ago, I got a chance to be the initial vice president for research at Morgan State University in Baltimore. And ever since then, um, it has been one of my callings to talk about both the innovation and research that happens in HBCUs and to be an advocate for investment uh, and funding for HBCUs, particularly in research, to take advantage of the innovations that both the faculty, students, and the staff uh, contribute. Thank you for sharing that background. You mentioned as you were sharing a bit of what I call your testimony, that the grace of God was actually very much present uh, in the life of you and your family. So as we were getting started with this podcast, mentioned that you have a number of favorite sayings, and I'm told that one of them is that God has called us to be instruments of his peace. Can you talk about how it is that that quote actually has informed your journey and even today why it is something that you try to live by all right wow um well i'll tell you what i, I really believe i I'm, i have just been looking at the struggles the struggles my mom went through she was quite active in the civil rights movement um but also i saw how maybe how can we bring be, be people together um, you know, my mom and dad were really trailblazers back in that time, being married and being an interracial couple. And I kind of always believed that maybe one of my things is to bring different groups of people together. So not only black folks, white folks. I mean, we grew up, we didn't have much money. But how to bring poor folks, rich folks together. How to bring people together and get them to the point where we can just say, hey, look, if you could do this one good thing, it could make a difference for a lot of people. And so I think that was part of, uh, prior to us, you know, when we were young, we became Catholic because we went to Catholic school. But my aunt was, was a, uh, a Baptist minister. And she always said, look, uh, at the end of the day, if you can change one person's life, you have an entry into eternity. And so I think at this time, where we're at through my career, it's always been, how can we change it to do better? How can we use research to create? new knowledge to make lives better for other people. And by doing that, how can we, how can I do that by being God's instrument? And that is maybe being an outstanding researcher, but at the same time going out to the schools and, and trying to inspire kids to say, hey, look, somebody like me who looks like you, you can be a scientist and an engineer and do good things. Um, how do we go out, if you look at something like the Black Engineer of the Year Awards Conference, how does that venue bring different people together? And we can start talking about how can we all work together? You know, because at the end of the day, when you go, when you go to heaven or wherever you believe in, um, there's no rich or poor. There's no black or white. Uh, there's no gay or straight. It's just God's people. And I think what he or she may be looking for at the end of the day is um, how do we uplift one body? So that's always kind of my intention behind whatever I do, because I think whenever you do something, you got to ask why you do it. And my intention is, how can I make this better than it was yesterday? How can I make it better than it was yesterday? That's a great model. So you mentioned a little bit about being a researcher and certainly as uh, someone who is a STEM professional by training and then, of course, uh, done a lot of work uh, in executive leadership and management. Can you tell us a little bit about how it is that you fell into STEM? We see from your CV that uh, you were a chemistry guy. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you land there? Oh, uh, well, uh, the other thing you do when you also grow up in D.C., so I was a, a tall, lanky kid. So uh, you learn how to do two things. 
are you either learn how to talk fast and you learn how to run. Because at that time, we had gangs in, in D.C. And so when you're a tall, lanky kid wearing Coke bottles for glasses, <laughs> uh, you learn how to do both, okay? And I remember we had a couple of gangs, and so to try to get in popular with, those, with the big boys there in order not to get beat up, I've always been interested in science, and you know, I watched a lot of B scientific movies and, and shows that would come on, like Lost in Space and Twilight Zone. So I went to the library because one of the things my mother did insist was she was a voracious reader, had tons of books, and wanted us to read, but also made sure we had to get a library card. And uh, I learned how to make gunpowder. And from learning how to make gunpowder, I learned how to make what they call uh, you know, make it explode. And for the guys in the gangs, they thought that was kind of neat because, you know, back then, around 4th of July, people would always get these things called cherry bombs or ash cans or M.A.s. Well, I figured out how to make that kind of stuff. And so they used to call me the professor. So that made me kind of popular. And, of course, I didn't have to worry about venturing out and worrying about get, getting beat up. Um, but also, you know, uh, at that time, then I started getting into chemistry. Um, and, and mixing different things at that time. I mean, you could actually buy a chemistry set. My mother bought me a chemistry set for Montgomery Wards. And they had all sorts of experiments. I remember I was in a seventh grade science fair. And uh, I, mean, I think my mom got really upset because I took one of her silver spoons and I copper plated it by putting it in a solution of copper sulfate and using a battery to show how do you do electrolysis. So I thought, hey, this is kind of neat stuff. And that just, you know, I pursued that through um, high school, and then I went on and, and decided to become a chemistry major, uh, and kind of the rest is history. I always liked doing things, and I guess one of them, doing things and learning how to do things with my hands was because when my dad died, uh, I was the oldest, and I was eight years old, and my mom looked at me in tears and said, you're going to have to kind of be, you know, the man of the house and do things. And so everything from changing a washer and a sink Okay, to learning how to change a switch on the wall. You know, it was just something that amazed me, but it also was a, a real confidence builder, you know, and I think something that a lot of kids lack today because when I became 16, the most important thing you had to do was learn how to keep your own car. And so uh, I was able to, my mother let me borrow her car. And the thing is, you had to keep it running because if you wanted to go out on a date, you know, you had two choices. You could go up to the girl you liked and say, we could take pu public transportation to a movie, or you could ride up in your car and say, I can drive you to the movie. So in that case, I had to learn how to work on the engine of the car as well as earn a little bit of money to put gas in the tank. So that's how all of this kind of stuff came together and, and kind of my curiosity for science. That's awesome. When you think about the dedication that you've had to the area of science, both as uh, a scientist yourself, but also as a leader in STEM, uh, let's let's talk about this competitive advantage that uh, we are considering historically black colleges and universities uh, as far as research in science and engineering are concerned. Uh, so I guess a, a fair question, even though uh, the High Tech Sunday audience is certainly probably uh, aware of HBCUs. In case there is someone who isn't, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what historically black colleges and universities are and how it is that they matter uh, to our competitive position here in the United States? Good question, good question. Well, first of all, for, for most who may not know about HBCUs, there's 101 of them that are accredited. But when we start talking about science and engineering, all of them have very, very good programs. But we can focus maybe that there are 22 uh, HBCUs that are either Carnegie classified as research intensive, they're classified as R2, and including the schools that are ABET accredited engineering schools. And so if you put that together, there's about 22 because there's 15 that accredited, there's 11 R2 schools, some, there's some overlap in some programs there. But what really is important and why they offer a competitive advantage for us globally is because that in their programs, 
while HBCUs may only constitute 3% of the engineering schools across the country, they put out 30% of the African American engineers at the undergraduate level. The other thing that's very important, particularly in STEM, HBCUs have a higher graduation rate in STEM as well as all MSIs at the undergraduate level uh, than majority schools. And an NSF, National Science Foundation's a recent survey, showed that of the top 10 schools that are producers of PhDs in STEM, eight of those schools are HBCUs. So we know going forward that STEM is extremely important in our society. We need people post high school who are part of the skilled technical workforce. Those are people who don't have bachelor's degree but have STEM capable skills like electricians, welders, IT people, bachelor's degree people, PhDs. HBCUs provide us that advantage. Because they graduate more folks at a, at, uh, in STEM, they are the seed corn for that. And three, they're really important for national security because a higher percentage of HBCUs have U.S. students versus majority schools. And for a lot of the industries that we have, particularly in the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, on their contracting industrial base, so if you think about the Bentleys, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, and, and smaller contractors, those folks can only hire U.S. citizens. And the HBCUs offer that type of talent. Plus, one more thing, it kind of goes back personal. Um, when I came out of Howard, you know, what some people call the Black Harvard, you know, there's a tendency that we worked a lot harder, okay, than in some of our counterparts in the majority schools, because there's always the old saying, as you probably know, Mark, in the community, that, you know, you have to work twice as hard to be just as good when you get into the overall society. And so we always had, and my colleagues said, we're going to show them. And many of us are did. Many of us went on to very good careers because we were always told, well, you know, do, do black people do science? Do they do research? Do HBCUs put out research? Well, I can tell you, in a place like Howard University, where I came from, you know, they were putting out some of the best research in chemical kinetics. At Morgan State, where I worked at, we were doing some great research in the areas of materials, uh, in the areas of computational chemistry. And so, and even at UDC, where I'm at right now, we have probably, in the DMV region, we have four science centers that are dedicated to advanced manufacturing. And so, HBCUs are, have a good value proposition for the country. They're not only good for workforce, because workforce is important. We put out top engineers and top scientists, men and women, who could hang with anybody else. But I don't want to just get us pigeonholed. It's just that we just produce the people who can work. You know, we also produce the people who can design, who can innovate, and who can reimagine new types of systems, materials, and technologies that can help our keep our country globally competitive. So very well put. And um, as you were speaking, I thought about here at Corning Incorporated, we've uh, had some videos done uh, over the last few years uh, in partnership with Mythbusters. And you just were a Mythbuster right there because there are a number of myths about HBCUs uh, in terms of output and the high caliber of training that you receive at those uh, historically co uh, black colleges and universities. When you think of the incredible productivity. You said 3-4% representation uh, of all engineering students uh, are at the HBCUs, but some 30% of the degreed engineers uh, of uh, uh, communities of color come from those schools. Why is it that it seems like HBCUs are still kind of like a secret when it comes to the value that they bring to so many sectors of our country? Well, you know, Mark, it's because, you know, paradigms are hard to break. And so the paradigms we've had in America is that talent, not only just STEM talent, but talent writ large, is from, is, is comes from the top 10% of the population, which in this case happens to be a majority white. 
And so, so for many times, where we sought after our talent, or should I say, if I use the analogy, mind our talent, was at the, the top schools, the Ivy League schools, the West Coast schools. Uh, and that's where we got our talent from. Um, but now when you're in a global competition, uh, and then also where you're worried about the security of your intellectual property, uh, you've got to say, look, where am I going to get more of that talent? Particularly, for example, and, you know, I just came off a panel working with the Navy. And the Navy has in its laboratories, they hire a lot of civilians. And these are scientists and engineers, and we're not talking any small numbers. We're talking tens of thousands of people. They have the added burden that everybody that they hire must be a U.S. citizen. So where can I find that talent? And if there's not enough people going in STEM at the high end of the scale, mostly in the majority population, then you've got to start digging deeper. Okay? And I tell people, that's where the HBCUs are a real asset to the country. But you know, uh, Mark, we've seen this before. I mean, remember. Think about it. In the Civil War, of the 600,000 soldiers who fought for the Union, almost a third of them were former slaves. Had they not had those 200,000 uh, slaves, they could not have possibly won the war. The same thing happened in World War II. We had to call on our population of folks to come and help. And in fact, the British would tell you it was Howard University and Charles Drew that made a significant contribution in terms of the transportation of blood plasma. Okay? Well, HBCUs, we sometimes forget our history, and we also forget about our contributions that they make and that they're making now to our industrial base. But now as we're becoming more globally competitive, and according to the Science and Engineering Indicators 2020 that just came out from the National Science Board in January, we realize in many sectors that we have global competition that's right behind us. And so to get that talent, and in some cases, the amount of foreign talent we can import is actually declining because people are deciding to stay where they are. We have to start making that investment in our talent here. We have to go after that diverse domestic STEM talent. And that's a national imperative. Thank you for that. And, and again, this is so hugely important uh, to be having this conversation right now as we are thinking about the challenges that the world has faced over the course of the pretty much the entirety of this year uh, due to the global pandemic that we are all living through. When you think about it, HBCUs have challenges unlike many majority schools. But all schools, all colleges and universities have been facing new challenges because of the COVID-19. And now that schools are returning to session, including HBCUs, what would you say are the unique challenges that those colleges and universities are facing as we continue through this pandemic crisis? Well, Mark, some of the biggest challenges not only HBCUs are facing, but all school is the, the transition and delivery of online learning. Um, I looked at, and many look at COVID-19 and the pandemic as actually exacerbating and uncovering a lot of issues that we knew that grew below the surface. And so for a lot of HBCUs, Many of them who ha have faculty members who had to come up to speed very fast to, to understand Blackboard and Coursera. Um, and in some cases, those transitions were kind of choppy. Also, our students are more in need. So even if everything is online, making sure you had students that had access. <coughs> Excuse me. We had uh, many students who who did not have computers. But even with the students who had computers, we had many students who even pre-COVID were working in hot spots and in, in, in coffee shops and other places because they didn't have internet access at home. Now that students are confined, we find out a lot of students did not, did not have internet access at home because they could not afford it. 
you know, or they had equipment that was not up to date. For example, they had routers that were 2.5 gig instead of 5 gig. So it didn't allow them to do the type of um, virtual meetings that many of us are doing right now and has become commonplace. Um, thankfully, the CARES Act and to the Department of Education, there was a lot of funding that helped HBCUs bridge some of these problems. But still, you know, HBCUs don't have the endowment base as many of the majority um, institutions do have. And so being able to call on um, other sources of revenue, particularly for HBCUs that relied on both tuition, but also activity fees and dormitory fees is going to be a challenge. I do believe, however, though, at this moment in time, because there's been a convergence of events in, in, you know, starting with the events that, with the pandemic, uh, with the murder of George Floyd, with many people coming out and realizing about systemic racism, that uh, HBCUs can take advantage of an environment to not only look at new business models, but to develop new partnerships um, and to be able to go out there and to serve their students. I mean, most HBCUs I know are not in it for the money. They're in it for the people, okay? And so because of that special mission and because they're anchor institutions within their community, um, I hope and I pray that the those communities, those alumni, as well as the federal, federal and state governments will put further investment to HBCUs in order because if we're gonna have to be globally competitive, we need those numbers in STEM and we need those and to get those numbers in STEM, we need to make those investments in HBCUs. HBCUs are a national asset. If you didn't have HBCUs, you'd have to create them. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. And I was really interested to hear you speak of the importance of partnerships. As we were saying, as we came on the air, the Advancing Minorities Interest in Engineering organization, Amy, is having its annual conference right now. Uh, and as you are aware, the deans of the 15 ABET accredited schools and colleges of engineering are, are affiliated with Amy. And one of the key topics is this year, sustainable relationships and partnerships. I know that uh, my co-host, uh, Lango Dean, is going to take us further in the conversation uh, in just a moment. But when you think about the kinds of relationships that are unique to historically Black colleges and universities, what would you say is key in making sure that those relationships, whether it's with folks in business and industry, folks who are uh, in government agencies, whatever the sector is, is there something unique about a sustained relationship that HBCUs are looking for, perhaps unlike majority institutions? You're listening to High Tech Sunday featuring Dr. Mark Vaughn, Lengo Dean, and our special guest, 2011 BEA Scientist of the Year, Dr. Victor McCrary. This week's episode is brought to you by the 2020 Women of Color STEM Conference. And now, a word from our sponsor. From waves of change, come oceans of opportunities. This has always been our Women of Color STEM Conference message and mission. Now more than ever, we are expanding our rich history and track record of hosting live streamed award shows and interviews, virtual job fairs, learning and networking experiences as we reset to rise at our 2020 Women of Color Virtual STEM Conference. October 8th through the 10th. The world is counting on us. Come ride the waves of change as you explore our limitless oceans of opportunities that can enrich, inspire, connect, and support your continued professional and personal growth that have always been the hallmarks of our women-driven conference. Together, we can help our nation's industries, government, academia, 
and the military, reset, reinvent, and re-energize. You belong here within our trusted community. Ride the waves of change as we reset to rise. The world is counting on us. Again, this episode of High Tech Sunday is brought to you by the 2020 Women of Color STEM Conference. Now, back to the show. I think in some sense uh, that HBCUs who take to the next step and in a post-COVID environment and in order to continue their mission, uh, we'll have to work on a number of levels uh, to your point of partnerships. One of those is obviously partnerships with their alumni. Uh, I think alums um, are going to have to step up. Now, we have to realize our alumni are not like the same alumni that come out of Harvard and Yale, okay? Um, they don't have the financial wherewithal, but they do have other networks that HBCUs can tap in and if they can give what they can. The other partnerships that HBCUs has to have with their local communities and with the politicians and elected officials in those communities and work, and, and work to nurture those because there are pipelines of anchor development. We did an economic study of Morgan State University back in 2017. And the result of that economic impact study was that for the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland, Morgan State University had something like close to a billion dollar economic impact. Recently, we just did another, we just did a study at the University of the District of Columbia. And that study has concluded that UDC, University of the District of Columbia, has a $400 million impact, economic impact on the District of Columbia and surrounding region. Those are not small numbers, okay? So it shows the economic impact. From there on, with that narrative, I think HBCUs also need to talk to their federal elected officials. Start working the Hill. Start talking to your congressional representatives, both in the Senate and in the House. As well as start building relationships, since I'm very much interested in science and technology, with the people who had the House Science Committees. Those things are extremely important. And then in your community, work with the local industry um, and work with the sense of not what they can do for you, but what you can do for them. So, you know, I would not go to one of our local industries and talk about waiting for you to write me a check. That's not important. It's more important about building the dialogue. How can I adjust my curriculum to put out the type of students who will become professionals who can help your business? In doing that, then the conversation starts back is, what can we do to help you to build that pipeline even stronger? And I'm particularly talking about the STEM areas, but not just STEM, also including business, finance, um, uh, in the legal professions. Then when you start that, that becomes true partnership. Because partnerships are not just transactional, they're transformational, okay? And it's not about what I can get from you or you can get from you from me, but what can we do together? And if it's more about what we can do together, then those partnerships will not only be sustainable, which means they'll outlast me or you, they won't be personality tied, but also they'll become part of the institution's DNA. Very, very well put not just transactional, but transformational. That's a great segue into the next part of our investigation of this competitive asset. And so with that, I'm going to hand off to my co-host, Lango Dean. Hey, Lango, how are you? I'm fine, Dr. Vaughn, how about you? I'm doing great, thanks. Victor is all yours. <laughs> That's wonderful, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the way you put that. Welcome to the show, Dr. McCrary. Um, you know, one of the things I enjoy about this show is the pre-briefing that we do. And um, guests talk about, you know, their um, past lives and, you know, things that happened to them growing up as children. And um, one of the, the stories that you told that 
and you talked about it again today with Dr. Vaughn, was this, uh, um, your, your um, um, I'm trying to find the right word here, when you didn't discover gunpowder, you just played around with it, and, um, you know, it impressed your friends, and um, there was a whole transformation in the relationship there once that was done. And when you told that story, it was probably about two weeks ago, I was just watching um, PBS, and there was this artist that came on on the show. She, she's from the University of Minnesota, and she was talking about playing with fire. She literally uses gunpowder, lights it up, and that's the way she makes her art. Now, she did that, and she, she's gone on to be an artist. You played with gunpowder, and you went on to be a chemist, world-renowned chemist. Another thing that you did was with ebooks. You had you invented the ebook or came close to doing that. Which brings me to the question of it's what Dr. Roy Wilson said at Wayne State University. You've experienced the challenges of the urban core culture, you've been immersed in diversity. So what do you say to HBCUs like A and T, which is now America's largest HBCU? for the seventh consecutive year, and it has had record enrollment for the fifth consecutive year. What do you say to them, to, to a and and to other HBCUs, as to how they compete with Ivy League schools, West Coast schools, and all that stuff? What do you say to them? Well, what I would say, and by the way, kudos to Harold Martin and his leadership at North Carolina a and he has just done a fantastic job. And I mean, I can't speak for, for Chancellor Martin, but I would say that I think he would view it as not as much as a competition, but as much of a journey and a mission. And that, that journey and mission is how do we create this eminent cadre of people of color in science and technology to help to help society and the globe? And so he has really inculcated that mission throughout all of his administrators and deans, um, and, and, and that feels it in the students. And I think what they are putting out and people are starting to see is, it's not necessarily important that you go to a school that has, that necessarily has name recognition in an Ivy League. Um, and it's not necessarily you have to go to a big school and that they have you know, uh, state-of-the-art laboratories. But I think what's more important is, particularly for students of color, you want to be a big fish in a small pond. And I would tell anybody, if they got to want to understand what parents should do and, kids, and encourage their kids, is to read Malcolm Gladwell's book called David and Goliath, where he talks about kids who are coming out of high school doing very well in STEM, and then, and for some reason, told to go to the bigger schools because they'll have the networks and they'll have better resources. But unfortunately, they don't have the navigational cap capacity or skills. And for many of students of color, they go to these places, and then, to his account, they have a 30% dropout rate in STEM versus that they go into smaller schools like North Carolina A&T for the HBCUs, you know, or even some small public schools they would have stayed in those areas. I would say go there. Now, North Carolina A&T may not have the dormitories that are on the, on the scale of plushness, say Harvard, you know, or Brown, but they have a group of people there that are about your success. And realize, and they'll look at people that help you all the way along your journey. Because for most of us, when we get into STEM, where particularly we get into calculus or we get into organic chemistry, it can be very difficult. But it's very difficult for a lot of people, including people like Albert Einstein. But if you have that nurturing and you have those role models, you can go out here and can compete with the rest of them. And so I would say for HBCUs, while HBCUs only educate 10% of African Americans, they can show that they have higher graduation rates in terms of particularly in the STEM areas and that their students go on to good jobs. I would tell them, start tracking those stories. Don't worry about the inputs. Worry about the outputs. How well are your students doing? How happy are they? 
whether they're making 40000 or 400000 okay? What are they doing to go on and make a difference? And I think if you start telling those stories, which I'm sure Chancellor Martin can say in North Carolina A&T, I'm sure David Wilson can say at Morgan State University, and I know Ron Mason can say at the University of District of Columbia, that when you share those stories, then people understand what eventually our students, what life is really about. Because at the end of the day, and I'm a Star Trek fan, there was an episode where there was a concern about riots, uh, people were harmless, uh, and, and how did it transform to the Federation? Well, you know how it transformed through the Federation? Because people realized that no longer, life was not about the accumulation of wealth, but it was about the accumulation of knowledge. And once we confer that ethos on our students coming out of HBCUs as well as our MSIs and TCUs, we can change society. We are on the cusp. And how exciting is that? I mean, I'm at UDC. I feel like I'm on a startup because our president has a great vision for how we develop talent, all levels. How do we work with those in the poorest wards of our city? We have an engineering school that has four research centers and is really kicking, kicking it in terms of bringing research dollars in and then opportunities, what more can you ask for? That if I were to lay down and die today, I can say I changed somebody's life. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the pandemic has created the perfect storm. Um, over the past several weeks, we've had, you know, a number of guests who talked about uh, the problems with the IT infrastructure. Um, a lot of kids aren't getting access, you know, to to the internet to be able to do their work. We've also talked about the mental, physical, and emotional needs of not just young people, of the people who care for young people, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers. So w with all of these things going on, and then, of course, there's the economic crisis as well, with all of these things going on, what can HBCUs do to better recruit more young people to their schools? What, what we can do as an HBCU community is, first of all, first say to ourselves, there's enough to go around for everybody. I mean, I was taught very young when we would go up for Christmas to my grandmother's house. My grandmother and all my aunts, all of them worked as maids and domestics. My uncles worked as laborers, but they all got around and they and they encouraged me. I mean, they would stand around me. I was, you know, short at the time, eight, nine years old, and they would all stand around and say, "You're going to be the one. You're going to be the one. You're going to be the one." And the next thing they told me is, "There's enough for everybody." They taught me about having a, a, a ethos of abundance versus scarcity. And most of these people, I mean, my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunts and uncles, I mean, they, they didn't have very, very much. But they told us there was a lot there, both spiritually as well as a lot of opportunity we go after. So I think for HBCUs, the first thing we got to do is we got to think of abundance instead of scarcity. Sometimes when, when you worry about when you're in buildings that are, are 50 years old, uh, when you have something like a pandemic hits you, um, you start thinking about scarcity consciousness. No, we have to go in abundance consciousness. We have to think that there's plenty of opportunity and enough to go around. And when I say enough to go around, that means we don't have to compete against each other, okay? Because each of us serves our community, and those unique communities need us. And so what we can do is work with each other to, for example, increase enrollments. I think also we have to go out and tell our stories because we don't have to worry about the students who come from the black middle class who are already doing well. Those students will have opportunities in the majority schools. But we have to reach out to what has been a lot, for example, our mission, to the students who don't have that type of access. And there are thousands of those students, as well as their students who are not in the same age demographic. For example, at UDC, we have a lot of uh, our median age is about 27, 28 years old. There are a lot of people in that demographic. We're looking for a pathway to the middle class. So I think that's how we increase our enrollments. 
as well as working in and, and working in partnership with our community colleges. Because um, not everyone wants to go to a four-year school right now. And there's nothing wrong about that. There shouldn't be any negative stigma. You know, there's a lot of skills and things you can learn in a two-year school. So by building those key partnerships, by, by adopting an abundance mentality, um, we can increase those enrollments because I think right now, many parents are now second guessing and saying, hmm, do I need to send my kid to a school that costs $40,000 a year, okay, and put he or she into debt or, or their parents? Um, and even if I do get aid, are, are my kids learning the right values of coming out of college? Because as I said earlier, it's not, life is not about the, accumul about the accumulation of wealth. Uh, abundance mentality is about the accumulation of knowledge and helping people. And through that, one becomes wealthy. And I'm not, not necessarily talking about dollars in your bank account, but I'm talking about a sense of being that you can lay down at night and know that you made a difference that day. And I think if HBCUs can articulate that value proposition, don't worry about trying to become like the majority schools, okay? That's not what you were there for in the beginning. You know, Howard is not trying to be like Harvard because that's not what their mission is, nor should it be, okay? And so if we stick back close to our mission, stick back close to who we serve, those environments will rise. And I, I will say, what Chancellor Martin has done at um, North Carolina A&T, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Thank you, Dr. McCray. Um, I really like that message um, of like, stick with your mission, focus on your community, and um, it's really important because when I lived in D.C., I know how important Howard was to us. Whether you were taking classes there, it doesn't matter. Whatever you were doing, Howard was just such a centerpiece for, for that Georgia, uh, Georgia, um, what is it, Georgia Avenue corridor? It was, yeah, exactly. It was just it was just the mecca for us in so many ways. So, you know, I get that on, on so many levels. But, you know, when you live at a time when a certain narrative is permitted, of your community, of, if your, of your personhood, how do you use those navigational skills that you often talk about? How do you prepare for college in this time when so many narratives are permitted? <laughs> because the first of all, so I, I'm a Roman Catholic and a Christian, and I truly believe uh, that God always makes good, okay? So the first thing we have to do is we have to look in the mirror and say, God, or, or whatever you want to say, Allah, the Creator, Yahweh, put me here for a purpose. And I mean, I know what that purpose is now. It may not be revealed to me, but I can find that out by helping other people. As well as taking good care of myself. I mean, God made us in his likeness. So as women and men, we need to do our best to make sure we're physically help, uh, healthy, make sure we're doing our best that we're reading and learning things that expand us and not hold us back, okay? It, it's, it's really important to value what you are. I mean, when I grew up, I remember we went from, from color to Negro to black, and I was so glad when the Black is Beautiful movement came around and people had pride that people started looking at themselves and that say, you know, I am somebody, as Jesse Jackson would say, I am beautiful. I don't have a mind. Okay. And, and, you know, getting back to STEM, you know, it's not that STEM is new to black folks or HBCUs. We have a long history of creation. Okay. And I remember my mom, I told you she had a lot of books, but she also had a lot of books about blacks in history, blacks uh, in science, blacks in poetry. And I mean, I was reading this at seventh grade. I remember the, the nun in the Catholic school I went to, Our Lady of Sorrows, you saw I had a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X on my, my desk in seventh grade. She says, why are you reading that? I said, because my mom told me it was a good book to read, all right? And so she backed off, you know, because I know mom wasn't going to do me any harm. We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta understand all of these things because there are, as you say, Lango, many narratives out there that say, because you look like this, 
you are stereotyped to do this. Because you went to this institution, or you came from this part of the country, or you came from this part of the African diaspora, you can only do this. You got to not let the lies fill your head, okay? And you will always be told lies about who you are because of what you look like. And you know what you got to do? You got to tune that stuff out, okay? Because the only person, yes, there is white supremacy, and it is systemic. But you know, as my mother always told me, you know, racism, white supremacy is like the sun. You can say, you know, I don't like the sun because I get a sunburn. And we got to do something to get rid of the sun. But you know what? Trying to get rid of the sun could be a hard job. But you know what you could do is invent, invent a pair of things called sunglasses and put them in your eyes. And you say, you know, now I can walk around. And that's what navigational capacity is. I'm so glad that the Black Lives Matter movement is getting a lot of recognition. I'm so glad I, I went out there with our UDC Law School and our dean, Renee Hutchins, gave her call out. We had six other schools from around the district marching. And I was so glad to see like, at least 50 to 75 percent of the people marching were white. I was glad because we're going to need those allies. But, you know, before things change, not going to change overnight, you still got to know how to get around. You got to still know about other people's culture and what they value okay and so it's important to value yourself it's important to be informed it's important to get that education it's important to learn what you need to learn okay and then be able to get around those and have mentors and advocates that help you to how to navigate through this country i'll give you a little story if you don't mind so i had an uncle on my father's side his name was mike mccrary um, so this is on my father's side. So he, he's, he's Irish American. Um, he had made hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance. And I think uh, we used to go see him you know, from 2001 on that we'd have a family reunion. So he was getting sickly and, you know, he, he you know, wasn't quite on the deathbed, but, you know, he pulled me aside. He said, Vic, I want to tell you three things you need to know if you're going to make it in this country. And I said, what's that, Uncle Mike? He said, the first thing you need to know, that the only difference between white people and people of color in this country, despite what people will tell you about intelligence and all of these other things, he said, the only one thing is inherited wealth. He says, make sure that you leave your kids something, not only your money, your property, but leave them with inspiration. Leave them with your network of mentors and advocates, OK? Because he said that's the difference. He says, look, I was a staunch Republican. I didn't believe in affirmative action. But as I grew older and, and you know, probably got wiser, I realized that if you start at a minus 150 and you're released as slaves and you don't have anything, how are you going to ever compete? So that was the first thing he said, because also he sold insurance. So he said, make sure you have insurance policy, you know, things that you can get cheap when you're young. The second thing he told me was, he said, Vic, uh, when your people network, the only thing they do is go around and carouse and drink. He said, when my people network, we go around and carouse and drink. But there's always a business opportunity that comes out. I think what he was saying was, let's not think about me, but we. He was thinking about, when we get together, let's think about what we can do to enrich ourselves, you know, not just in our pockets, but in our minds. Okay. Um, don't just use network and it's just to get together, but use also a network as an opportunity for social change. And then the third thing he told me, he says, look, the system is rigged against you. OK, he said, as a white man here in Texas, he said, even if I didn't have any money, I can go and get me a half million dollar loan with no collateral. He said, you and your wife, with all your fancy degrees, uh, you still might even not get it. He says, but don't act like a victim. Don't keep talking about the man. Uh, but he says, figure out how to get around and work the system without getting locked up and staying legal. And I think what he was telling us then was, yes, we need those protests for Black Lives Matter, and we need to keep doing things like that. But we also need to teach our kids how to get around uh, and, and not tell them, you know, hey, look, you're never going to make it. But say, hey, look, this is what you got, this is what you got to do um, if you're going to live in this society. Okay, and you can be anything you want, but these are the pitfalls you have to watch. 
I mean, so for example, my wife is from the Bronx, New York. Um, she's Puerto Rican. We made sure our kids were bilingual. Why? Well, not only cultural pride for her, but let's face it. I mean, after Mandarin Chinese um, and English, Spanish is one of the most spoken around. I want my kids to have options. So if they need to get jobs, if they can go out and say, look, they can speak two languages, that's great. All right? And so it's those type of things we need to tell our folks, say, hey, look, we may be fishing with the shortest pole. We may not have the same type of investment capital. We may not have the legacy of mission as a lot, a lot of others who can get into Harvard. But what we have to do is figure out how the system works, get elders like myself to teach those kids those navigational skills, to build those networks, and figure out how to get the system to work for you. All at the same time, make sure we are still having people like the third good marshals who went up and, and challenged the system. Make sure we have those folks like the John Lewis's who say, let's keep making good trouble. But at the same time, before that system changes, let's make sure that we're doing what we can to give our kids an opportunity. You know, Because the worst thing we can do as people of color particularly in the STEM area, and I saw this many times when I was, for example, at Bell Laboratories. I had colleagues who graduated with PhDs out of MIT and Harvard and naively thought because they had attained that level, there was no racism because, let's face it, science is science. Two and two is always four, no matter what part of the globe you go to. Unfortunately, what they didn't understand is two and two equals four is manifested by people. People have biases. And so don't ever be fooled by the credentials you get or where you're at, but understand where you are. You know, there's an old saying, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. So in America, understand what America is about. And, he, and with all of its uh, issues that it has, understand you can still find opportunity, but also understand you're going to have to learn how to navigate. And that, to me, is why I, would, I, I think HBCUs, HSIs, TCUs, they bring so much value. And if I'm a parent, I, you know, that's where I would send my kids if they had that opportunity. That's wonderful, Dr. McCrary. So basically, let's remember the same brain that can compute two plus two is equals four also has biases. But guess what? you're not going to let the lies take over your brain. You're not going to, you've got to tune out, tune those things out. You got to focus on the inspiration, the people who provide inspiration around you. You've got to focus on your network of advocates. And the one thing I like about this show and Bea and, and women of color STEM and, and all that sort of thing is that it provides a ready network of advocates. And with all the good things combined, you can keep, watching out for the pitfalls, and then you can worry later about building capital and getting property and all that good stuff. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McCrary. It's been really inspirational talking to you. Uh, I'm going to step back to, step back now and, uh, uh, and hand you back to uh, uh, Dr. Vaughn. Thanks again. Thank you, Langer. Thank you so much. Wow, that was a great wrap up already, Lango. And so all I can say, Dr. Victor McCrary, is that it has been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. You have said so much that is so timely and uh, it's a gift to High Tech Sunday. And we've got a lot of work to do, but you've laid out a great path and uh, we are going to continue to be committed to uh, following in that journey. Thanks again. And let me ask you one thing, Mark, before you conclude. Just remember one thing, Romans 831. With God before us, who can be against us? Amen, brother. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Brandon Newby for our conclusion. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of High Tech Sunday. Career Communications Group's High Tech Sunday 
looks at professional development and technology through the lens of spiritual philosophies. In a time when digital information is more critical than ever, this weekly program is produced by and for CCG's community of alumni and professionals in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. The community runs from national thought leaders to aspiring students, and this weekly series aims to bring a concentrated discussion around technological advancements and achievements based on universal moral principles. The one-hour podcast will be streamed every Sunday. The podcast can be accessed through the Bay of Facebook page, Women of Color Facebook page, and CCG YouTube page, in addition to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and Spotify. Please join us next time.